welcome back to the Halo mini series, part one, Create Your Talent Factory, featuring David Wazell, Vice President and Partner at the Pipeline Institute. My name is Douglas Brown, CEO at Halo Consulting, a certified minority-owned executive search firm based in Chicago. David, we're, we're super excited to have you join us today for our second edition of the Halo mini series, where we discuss what is keeping you up at night. Um, before we get started, and sharing a little bit about your journey and how you arrived at the Leadership Pipeline Institute. Yeah, thanks, Douglas. I appreciate you having me. I'm excited to be able to talk to your community and thankful that you bring this group together on a regular basis. So um, as Douglas said, I'm David Loisel. I'm now with the Leadership Pipeline Institute. We're a global leadership consultancy firm based out of Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, prior to that, I was the chief people officer at Project 44, which is a Chicago-based supply chain technology company and spent the past 25 years in operations, leaderships, and talent roles um, throughout the course of my career. I'll tell you though, two years ago, um, I started at Project 44 and, and the company had some pretty significant growth and milestones. Um, I'm gonna share those because contextually, I think it matters to how I ended up to where I'm at today. Um, we grew from a 300 person company to a 1300 person company in less than two years. We expanded our uh, employment footprint from 12 countries to 35 countries. We grew our revenue from 35 million to 150 million in revenue. We raised $750 million in capital, acquired five companies and integrated those companies. Um, I share that because the one thing I noticed during my time at Project 44, um, and now I kind of realize as I reflect back to the 25 years of my career, is that your business and equally importantly, the people in your business, whether they be employees, customers, investors, they do rely on leaders of the organization to do a couple key things. They rely on the leaders to have the right skills that they can design and execute a business strategy. They rely on leaders to focus their energy and attention on the right priorities at the right time. And they rely on leaders to enable people to deliver the objectives and the expectations of the organization. So, you know, thinking of that, it's how I landed at Leadership Pipeline Institute, that these requirements, they, they not only have leaders needing the skills to select, assess, and develop their teams to deliver, but it also requires leaders to develop themselves allowing themselves to be able to evolve and grow as the organization does. So um, that's the type of work I do now and thrilled to be able to talk to you a bit about it today. It really remarkable HR journey you've had and excited to see you know, what you're able to accomplish. Partner and nice. vice president. Um, David, let, let's dive into our first question. How can organizations adjust leadership development initiatives to adapt to the economy's ever-changing landscape and uncertainty uh, to ensure organizations are building upon the necessary skill. Yeah, it's a great question and a good starting point for us today. I will say, I think the word adjusting, uh, although important, is a bit misleading of a word, and I'll, and I'll explain why. Um, I'd like to start by talking a bit about why I think leadership uh, development often fails. Um, you'll see here, according to the Association of Talent Development, that's ATD, um, there are some pretty critical reasons why leadership development often doesn't yield the results that's needed. And so the first one is, um, deals with, you know, kind of the relevant and applicability of the job. Uh, business objectives may change as the economy and other macro and micro factors shift. But the job that needs to get done at each leadership level remains fairly consistent. So I'll dig into that a little bit later, but leadership development does need to be relevant to the work you're actually doing, and sometimes it's not connected. Um, second is that you have to have some flexible activities around that. Notice the report doesn't say flexible skills. It talks about activities. So how do people learn and develop, and how do we enable that? That's one challenge that needs to be overcome. Uh, next is that there are kind of value changes to what leaders do uh, and how leaders deliver value to an organization. Um, this one's really critical because it's it's really actually super true that leaders provide you know different value, especially at different levels, and that's changed over time, especially as we move towards innovative and knowledge work being so critical uh, to deliver results for businesses. Uh, next challenge is. Uh, that the impact needs to be measured. This is kind of the magic trick in leadership development. Without measuring the impact of development on your people and on your business, how do you know where to adjust, going back to that word, 
to, and, and focus on what needs change and improvement in your organization. And the final point I think is critical, although maybe not relevant today, is, is really the square peg round hole analogy. Um, if we try to force someone into leadership because maybe that's the only growth path within an organization, the desire to actually lead and have those skills is rarely there. So when you're thinking about the challenge of leadership development and some of the key areas that organizations need to start with, um, it's really about organizations having an enduring leadership development culture. So this is regardless of changes in the economy. They don't want to, you know, they shouldn't be chasing kind of the latest theme, going after the buzzwords or even the buzzy technology solutions. They have to build a framework, uh, but a framework that's flexible. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of one of the core aspects of building a, an enduring leadership uh, development strategy, um, having proper leaders at the right levels, building clear differentiators of core responsibilities between those levels, and then setting up the process to select, assess, and develop leaders based on those differentiators. So that's kind of the, the starting point. Yeah, that's, that's a really good segue into our, our next question that touches on framework. What, what steps can organizations take to define the different levels of leadership within organizations to ensure the right support and growth are delivered at each level? Yeah, you know, I think it's the, the right kind of guidance into thinking about it within your organization. So let's talk about that framework. And thank you for pulling up this slide. Um, there are, you know, many of your viewers have probably, uh, you know, maybe likely been involved in some sort of job architecture or job leveling activity in their career. I, I want to be clear, this is not a job architecture activity. A leadership framework really has nothing to do with job titles or compensation bans or anything like that. A leadership framework has to do with identifying the job that needs to get done at each level and recognizing what leaders need to do to properly transition into that next level. So what do they need to start, stop, or continue doing as they move forward in their career? Um, I'll give some examples of that. Um, in most organizations, frankly, you know, especially mid-sized and, and up, we'll have some form of leaders at most of these levels you see here, but you'll also see that sometimes leaders may choose to go into leadership, but sometimes leaders, meaning a leader of self, may choose to go into an enhanced specialist career. And that's really important if we can allow them to do that. So let's take a look at kind of how this framework would work. And I'll give you a couple examples as we go through this. Um, as a valued employee makes their first career decision, they may choose to move into that leadership role. And they're gonna transition often from what you call a leader of self to a leader of others. So here, the change required going from a leader of self, leader of others, is that you need to shift how you get value for the organization. So you're getting results through personal proficiency as an individual contributor or a professional leader of self, and you're getting results through others as a leader of others. Now, the interesting part is sometimes people are like, oh, well, I only have one or two direct reports, so I still have to do the work. That absolutely makes sense. In a framework like this, the amount of focus you have on leading versus doing can shift depending on the size of your team. If you had a full team of say 10 or 12 people, as a leader of others, you should be probably spending more time on selecting, assessing and developing your team rather than doing the actual work. If you look at that next level, once someone has transitioned to a level of leader of leaders, many of their direct reports may no longer be individual contributors, but instead managers or leaders in their business. So therefore, their primary responsibility is to mobilize and enable leaders to get the best possible results from their teams. So less about technical skills of that function and more about how to enable leaders within their function. And then we'll just give one more example. Uh, leader, you know, this could be a, a CXO level or maybe a division leader in a business. Um, the contribution that that business should, should be getting from someone, someone transitioning, transitioning into a functional leader role. It's really about a competitive advantage of, of the function by deploying a business strategy in consideration of the other functions in your business and then driving excellence through accountability, empowerment and efficiencies. So you'll see these are very different jobs or at least at each level, very different core responsibilities. Most companies will need their leaders to operate at the right level to enable them to gain the right skills at each level to produce value back to the organization. Thanks for sharing that that breakdown on the, the framework, David. Um, 
where, where in your career did you realize that you were uh, at a pivotal point of your, your first professional transition option? Yeah, I, I was a, a, a subject matter expert in kind of the first space I was in, in, in leadership development or in talent development. Um, I frankly built out training programs and delivered them as, as the core part of my job. And then I moved into a role that had a team of global trainers, a small team, but four people across across the country, not, not the globe, uh, and, and realized that um, my expertise of being a really good program developer and deliverer of training was not the skill needed to help my team thrive. Uh, and I frankly rode that wave a little too long. So my transition took a little longer than it should have. I maintained my value as a subject matter expert versus someone who could lead a team to become their own subject matter expert. So the transition is pretty important. And the earlier you pick up on it, the earlier you can then thrive within that level, preparing yourself for the next level. Is there any advice you'd give to the audience on um, kind of what you just shared, you know, being in that role for a little too long? Uh, is there anything that you could you would have done differently? Yeah, a couple things. One I would say is, is find a mentor, I'll use that word loosely, but someone who has um, performed at a high level at either your current level or your desired level uh, and ask them what they're doing differently than they may have done as an individual contributor or at a lower level. And the second thing is to really start to list out what you need to start, stop, and or continue doing as you transition. So don't assume that what got you here is going to get you there. Instead, really start to look at the start, stop, and continue of that new role to be successful. Let's move on to our next question, David. Uh, what strategies can organizations implement to maintain a flexible strategy that supports the ever-changing demand of an organization? And how can organizations ensure the leadership development initiatives align with the current business? Yeah, a couple of things going on in that. So I'm going to break it into to two different uh, responses. First, how do organizations create that flexible strategy to support changes? I would say that they should start by asking themselves a, a few core questions. Question one is, what needs to get done? What needs to get done from a leadership perspective? And then two, who is de doing well at that and who needs improvement? So here's how this could play out. After you first identify the leadership framework and you map the roles to the correct level, you should look to identify what needs to get done at that level. So what skills are needed to have a leadership team that properly selects, assesses, and develops their team. Now, this could be based on leadership competencies. Um, competencies are a great tool and there's a lot of different uh, baselines, uh, databases in order to create competency lists. I will say one mistake I've seen some organizations make is that they assume um, a single set of leadership competencies applies to all level, when in reality, as we just discussed, there are different skills required at different levels. Um, we actually use a research-based job profile uh, at my current employer um, for each level as a starting point when we work with organizations. This helps us identify kind of the critical core behaviors that need to be executed well at each, each level. I'll actually show you examples of that shortly. But anyway, once you've identified the job that needs to get done at each level, what the requirements are. The right assessment tool is really critical. So some sort of 360 evaluation um, that is based on the job requirements at that level, allowing you then to identify who has significant proficiency within their role, but who also needs to improve in that role. Identifying the job that needs to get done and then assessing against those behaviors, organizations can adjust to what they need to develop folks on and who needs to be developed um, so that they can invest in the right area. So second question, I think, is a, a little more of aligning it to business objectives. Um, this is really foundational to have you know, properly identified leadership levels that clarifies the work that needs to get done. Business objectives should be driving the skills and the developmental objectives that are needed within an organization. But if everyone thinks that their job is to develop the strategy, regardless of what level they're at, and no one realizes that they're meant to develop, they're meant to develop the people to execute the strategy, there's going to be a disconnect in that alignment. So, you know, no one is enabled to implement the business strategy. Everyone is just kind of building it on the top. So uh, just recognizing the difference between levels of leadership and what their core responsibilities are is a critical component. 
David, with, with your experience at Project 40, or um, stepping into that role with 300 employees and going through some hyper growth to 1300 employees, um, were, were the leadership levels properly identified? No, good question. Um, they really, they were not when I got there. And, and it makes sense. It was a pure startup um, when I first joined the organization. Um, and in fact, uh, through acquiring five different uh, companies over the course of two years, it even created more of a need for proper identification because titles at, um, were all over the place, as you can imagine. VPs that were doing individual contributor work, uh, directors who were leading a function. And so that was one of the first things we needed to do was clearly identify the work that people were doing at each level and get them um, mapped to the proper uh, level within a leadership framework so that we could enable their growth, we could enable clarity as to what their role was. Um, but that took uh, a bit of a process to make sure that everyone um, was properly mapped. Got it. That, that context. Um, let, let's move on to our next question. Um, you've touched on leadership skills a couple of times. Uh, what tools or resources can organizations leverage to help leaders acquire the skills and comp acquired for success? And does technology play a role in the success? Yeah, I mean, as you can imagine, there are so many resources out there that are providing solutions for leadership development and building skills. Uh, probably too many because it gets a little bit uh, confusing as to where to go for, for really great solutions. Um, some of them are shinier than others, some of them a little more well established than others. I would say that each organization first needs to identify what they're trying to solve for. As an example, um, are you in the need of creating a talent strategy and framework first because you have leaders that don't know where their responsibility starts and where their responsibility ends? You might want to find a solution to, to, to start there. You might be an organization that just needs to enable leaders to select and hire the best people because they've got some near term growth demands uh, and that might be an important skill set. Or maybe your leaders need to engage and develop uh, more senior level business leaders first because there's some dysfunction happening across the organization at that level. So start by identifying what your need is. Um, the best success that I've seen in organizations getting value through leadership development is when they start with a strategy and then determine if they can build versus buy the solution. So some teams can build um, solutions in-house to get um, really good skill development. Some need to buy solutions. Um, if you've identified the strategy and you know what skills uh, you need to develop through that mapping and assessing of each level. There are some easy ways to build skills through developmental journeys. So LinkedIn learning is a good example. A lot of people have probably crossed that path. If you are building a learning journey for a leader of others and have identified five core skills, how to select the best team members, how to assess performance, how to develop skills, how to provide one-on-one -on -one feedback, how to coach in the moment, whatever those five skill sets are, um, you can source uh, uh, learning modules or nuggets through tools like LinkedIn Learning, and there are a whole bunch of others. Um, the one thing I will recognize is that, you know, as we talked about with that ATD report, if the learning is not immediately applicable to the job, um, it is less likely to stick. So one thing we do is our learning journeys are uh, embed 100% real life current challenges into a six month journey that includes an execution and development plan. So if we've identified these five skills, we bring people together with real business challenges they're having in selecting, assessing, developing, engaging their team, and they walk out of their development uh, session with an execution plan that they bring back to the workplace so they get to practice it. So I, I recommend folks do that. Um, and then once you've you know identified what those skills are, finding different tools are critically important. From a uh, technology perspective, um, I would say that today's learner is really interested in learning on demand. So providing people with whether it be um, a, a mobile solution to be able to practice different um, scenarios uh, as they're as they're growing, or possibly a database of you know different courses for them to be able to to um, get the the training that they need is critically important. You know, some some companies will uh, lean in pretty heavily on. Um, uh, LMS is a learning management system. I, I will say learning management system is really critical if you have a lot of content already and you can build out those learning journeys. Um, if you don't have contact, content or if you don't know 
what you need to develop skill sets on for your team. If you haven't started there, um, that LMS solution might be uh, underutilized uh, at that time. So, so start with the strategy, understand the skills, find some of the content, and then build it into a technology. Are, are the resources that a uh, hundred person startup would use different than the tools that um, like a 12 or 1300 organization would use? Yeah, that's a, a good question. There are thankfully wide ranges from directly off the shelf kind of per person, you know, click in and get someone set up into in, in, in a solution all the way to the large enterprise workday uh, level uh, solutions. There are a wide range, um, you know, hop, I would recommend utilizing like G2 Crowd or some of the other um, rating solutions in order to filter down, you know, I am a 200 person organization looking to do this. What are some of the better solutions um, versus always assuming you need an enterprise level Level, uh, solution that is probably going, going to be much, much more difficult, difficult to implement and uh, not, not get, get the cost, cost uh, the ROI that you're looking for. And I, I want to touch on your own experiences, David. So we, leading the HR function at ShiftGig, Numerator, and Project 44, uh, what tools or resources uh, did you leverage? Um, yeah, I, I, quite a range of them. We, you know, when you're with a, starty, uh, a scrappy startup, uh, you do need to be a little more cost uh, efficient, cost effective. So some of those, um, you know, from a from a learning management perspective, learning management system, uh, an easy tool to start with is a is a tool called Litmus, um, Litmos. Uh, that you can sign up for a very small uh, level account. There are some tools and data and um, content that you can build directly in there. And so those are some of the smaller level ones, um, all the way up to kind of large scale workday level solutions. Um, my recommendation, again, would be to identify the, the right, the need that you have in your organization, and then look for how a solution can fill that need um, versus just going with the, the, the shiny object that you may see you know, promoted on LinkedIn or whatnot. We've touched on leadership skills a bunch up to this point, David, um, but let's go ahead and highlight uh, connecting skills to the, the business strategy. Here is an example for leaders of leaders, and these are core behaviors that anyone who is leading uh, a group of leaders um, can define their success by. And it starts with translating the strategy into operating plans and then driving that productivity. So this is the focus area for connecting the strategy of the business and the business objectives to the leadership uh, actions. Um, from there, the need for a leader of leaders to develop their leaders, to assess and improve, and improve their performance, to lead across the organization and ultimately build their organization are core components that connect the work the leaders do directly back to the business objectives. David, let's, uh, let's move on to discuss the definitions of leadership. Uh, we have the leadership of others, the leaders of leaders, and functional leaders. Um, how can organizations assess the growth and development of their leaders at each level of leadership and recognize any gaps or obstacles that may prevent a full transition into the next level of leadership? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great topic. And I'll answer that by sharing some typical transition issues at each level. And I think this will resonate with a lot of the audience here. Um, it's a good place for our viewers to begin thinking about um, how they stack up personally and how maybe individuals uh, in their organization have begun to transition appropriately into their levels, uh, into their level. So first, as a, a leader of others, some of the transition issues is that they may be micromanaging instead of delegating. This is someone who's moved from an individual contributor into that first time manager role or managing a team, and they're still really good at doing the task. So they're in there. Um, competing with their direct reports, they know how to do it best. They might avoid tough conversations with their direct reports because they were once friends with them or they were they sat next to them and did the same type of work um, that you might they might find themselves taking over the direct reports work rather than letting them do their own job. And frankly, they might not allocate the right time and energy towards answering questions and supporting their direct reports. They find it more of a disturbance rather than an opportunity to coach and develop because they haven't fully transitioned their mindset. As a leader of leaders, um, this is a little bit different from a transition issues. They may not recognize the need and fail to develop 
their direct reports into effective leaders. Again, no longer the individual contributor work, but into a leadership role. Um, they may uh, follow up directly and kind of skip a level, follow up directly with an individual contributor instead of following up through the leader of others. And that creates communication challenges. Uh, and also a leader of leaders that has a transition issue or, or hasn't fully transitioned may focus only on their own unit and not kind of build value across the organization. So kind of creating that cross-functional value chain. They're just focused on their one role. And then as a functional leader, which is a critically important strategic role, um, someone who hasn't transitioned fully might focus on only their own function versus uh, you know, kind of the true uh, cross-functional organization. They may prefer spending time with people in their own function and not become part of that full business team. They may not contribute towards the, the global company strategy and only stay within the four walls of their function. Uh, they may consider own areas of the function to be more important and so might um, belittle some of the other functions in an organization. And they may be looking more at short-term results versus the long-term results that strategic look forward. So thinking of some of these uh, things that we've discussed today, if you don't first have a framework, identify the skills that are needed at each level, you can't accurately assess the current straight, uh, state, you can't set development plans and then measure the impact. So it really is important to connect the strategy and have people yeah. operating at the right level. David, do you, do you have any uh, quick takeaways that you could share with the audience of, you know, if, if I am a leader of others or a leader of leaders or a functional leader that, you know, might be touching on, on some of these different aspects, any, anything you can share? Yeah, I think I would, say, yeah, I, I think I would the, go back um, to the modeling, um, leaders, modeling leaders that you really respect. respect. Look at individuals, Look at individuals who are in, who are in uh, the, uh, role the role that, that you are you're moving, moving towards, towards or, or that, that you are in newly and see how they're operating really successfully. I often think of you know business leaders that I've respected and said, how is that person so good at what they do? But look, look at the work and how they plan their, their time. Right? So, right? so like what, what how are they spending their time? Oh, they're spending their time developing their team versus doing work. work. And I'm finding myself actually doing work right, right now. That, that might, might not be the right, right behavior. behavior. Or they're, they're relying on others to set the strategy for their team because you know they're too removed from from what the uh, business goals and results need to be so look at others that are successful at the level that you're aspiring to and start to model out some of those behaviors because it's a good way to identify where maybe you have um, gaps in your own performance and i would also say be open to feedback ask individuals either on your team or peers or supervisors where do you see uh, the need to um, to to uh, transition into the full role. What have you not yet let go of, and then started doing uh, the work that you should be doing? Last question we'll cover today: What strategies can organizations execute to deliver an effective leadership development program for leaders that align with individual and professional objectives that support the long-term vision and strategy uh, for the organization? Yeah, so many times organizations look to develop leaders without considering what needs to get done in the business. And so um, what you'll see here is a simple diagram demonstrating the way of create the, the, the why and the how to create structured development plans. So first, you have to have business objectives and ideal world. If, if those business objectives can cascade down to the level of the leader you wish to develop. So if you have a business objective around you know, uh, sales targets, and then you have a, you know, sales director in, in charge of a certain region, you should have sales targets for that business leader uh, in order to understand what his contribution towards your company objectives are. So you really need to cascade down those business objectives. Then based on those objectives, what skills and behaviors need to be demonstrated by leaders at each level in order to help deliver on those business objectives. And then the development plans should match the, the development of those skills. And so development plans can be based on one of two objectives. Uh, first, uh, you're either looking to develop the person for proficiency in performing their current job, or you're looking to prepare them for the next job. But the inputs on those development activities should align with what needs to get done in the business. 
And frankly, it could be done primarily through job experiences or building relationships. You'll see here the 70-20-10 rule, uh, giving people an opportunity to, to contribute to new teams, to develop their skills, to work on stretch assignments that they maybe um, don't have in their everyday uh, responsibility list, to work with other individuals, whether it be different leaders or different teams, and uh, better understanding how they're uh, succeeding, so building the relationships. It's not always about taking a course or learning a skill in a in a uh, some sort of training session. Um, the developmental work on the job and through relationships uh, and learning from others can be a critical way of doing that. In, in most cases today, businesses really need to be agile in how they set these business objectives and then how they connect developmental goals. So it's unlikely that you'll see you know, significant organizational value if you just do, you know, once a year objective writing and once a year development plans. Um, many companies are moving to, you know, quarterly revisits of goals and objectives and then assigning the developmental activities that are associated with those on a quarterly basis. As we conclude, David, uh, you've provided valuable insight into flexibility with a a framework, uh, what transition success looks like and uh, structured leadership development and really the importance behind setting up your talent for success. Um, from, from your perspective, is, is there anything you'd like to share or talk about in terms of the work you're doing at the Leadership Pipeline Institute? Yeah, I mean, we, I think we covered a lot here and, and just to kind of think back to my own career, I, I do remember at my last job not really knowing where to start and you mentioned uh, you know, if the levels weren't set, where do you start? So if many of you are feeling that way, please uh, do reach out. I'd love to learn what's happening in your world and share war stories. Um, you know, at the Leadership Pipeline Institute, we do partner with organizations in a variety of ways. We often start by understanding, you know, what the gap is or learning what the gap is in the skills that they need to develop in their leaders. We'll map out those job behaviors for uh, your organization and we'll help you set assessment tools in order to identify the what skills need to be developed and with whom, and then put a plan together for development journeys for the right individuals in your organizations. So I would love the opportunity to, to create an impact at your organization, um, but I also would love the opportunity to just talk about the challenges you're having. It's, a, it's always a fun conversation. We appreciate you having you, David. Uh, thanks for tuning into part one of our Halo mini series, Create Your Talent Factory. Uh, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button uh, and sign up for our monthly Halo newsletter, uh, which summarizes current market trends and recaps past events that we posted. Um, and the Halo newsletter is the Halo Content Hub, which can be found via LinkedIn. Um, we are excited to announce our upcoming virtual roundtable event next Friday, April 25th navigating the future of work and innovative approaches to leadership. And David will be serving on that panel next Friday. Um, and the registration link can be below. And uh, like I said, thanks again for your time, David. And please tune in next week for part two of our Halo mini series, uh, Create Your Talent. Thank you, Douglas. I appreciate you bringing us together. Big fan. <laughs> <laughs>